Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, we're going to be taking a look at the internet right after this. Internet at 50 years, that is. So we've just passed a milestone at the end of October, uh, the birth of the Internet. And so I thought I would spend a little bit of time today talking about that, where we've been, where we are, and maybe a little bit about where we're going. Uh, but I guess the, the first thing we need to talk about is who actually invented the Internet. And I'm sorry to say Al Gore was not one on, on my list. Um, I suppose that the real credit needs to go to Nikola's Tesla, because in 1905, he came up with the idea for a global communication system uh, using wireless communications. And unfortunately for him, he had started building that, and his first round of funding ran out. He couldn't complete the tower, uh, and the Marconi uh, wireless uh, overtook and overtook his work. And so sadly, his idea uh, went to the wayside, and, and he didn't receive a second round of funding. However, it's interesting that his ideas in principle are being resurfaced today to be worked on. It's, I think that's fascinating, and I think that's really great. Nicholas, uh, Nikola was a, a brilliant person, a brilliant engineer. Um, and uh, I think uh, if, he hadn't, um, if he hadn't lost that second round of funding, he, we might have seen the Internet rise a lot faster <laughs> than it finally did. Uh, Paul Otlet and Vannevar Bush published, uh, well, they published different papers. Uh, Paul published his in the 1930s and Vannevar in the 1940s. Both of them envisioned a mechanized uh, searchable storage system for books and media. It was what they had uh, uh, wanted to look at. And, and it didn't mention hypertext by name, but it did allude to it. Uh, in the search system to be able to find and be able to retrieve uh, books and media. But the ARPANET uh, was the first communications network that, that provided node-to-node -node communications between computers. And, uh, uh, and so, talk about that for a minute. So it was funded by the Advanced uh, Research Projects Agency, or ARPA, which was a, is, and is called DARPA today. It is an arm of the Department of Defense. And as I recall, the original reason for this research was to provide an uninterruptible uh, communication system in the event of a nuclear war. So it would allow messages to transfer using alternate routes to get to the end, the end point that they wanted to move a message to. That might be folklore. I have never seen that written down anywhere. Uh, but it was originally called ARPANET. Uh, and it was based on a packet switching design by Paul Barron, uh, Donald Davies, uh, Leonard Kleinrock, and uh, Lawrence Roberts. And uh, I have it listed here as network control protocol. It's not correct. It's network control program. And that was really the early packet switching uh, method used for communication. That was the algorithm for performing the communications. I don't want to call it X.25 because it isn't. Uh, it was a very primitive form of packet switching, but it did allow uh, that intercommunication between nodes. Ted Nelson uh, was a very early pioneer in hyper, hypertext media, uh, and he published his, his book in 1965. He also published uh, another book in the mid-70s called uh, Literary Machines and Dream Machines, I think it was what it was called. Uh, where he outlined further his designs. For, but his, ver his vision of hypertext is far different than what we have today. And uh, I think if he had completed his model, the, the amount of information that we would be able to link to would be orders of magnitude higher than it is today. And it's unfortunate, but it, that is a very difficult problem to solve. Uh, as those of us in computer science know, a many-to-many -many association is very difficult to try to solve it without having an intermediary table. Um, Robert Kahn invented the transmission control protocol, the internet protocol, in the mid-1970s. Um, and uh, the expansion of the ARPANET really occurred about 1981. Uh, the National Science Foundation and the Computer Science Network, uh, the CSNet, 
both contributed heavily to the uh, uh, to the continuing uh, uh, you know uh, bringing out additional nodes and attaching additional nodes to the ARPANET uh, throughout 1981 up until about 1990 or so when their funding finally ran out and it converted over uh, to the public as we know today. The, the transition to TCP/IP uh, by ARPANET occurred in 1983. I know this is going to be controversial, but it is generally accepted that Ray Tomlinson of MIT invented email in 1971. His first email message was, Shh, don't tell anyone, we're not supposed to be working on this. And email was not his assigned project. It was just a side project that he thought would be cool to try to do. Uh, and um, there is a, a, an, another man that, uh, that developed uh, a, a program called email. And I'll put a link to his name below uh, in there that uh, really resembles more of what the email systems look like that we uh, use today. Uh, Ray's version of an email system was very primitive. Uh, it, it, it didn't have attachment, support attachments, no HTML, of course, no, uh, no, no additional fonts, no formatting. It was just text. <laughs> so you could... There was ways to send binary files. We wanted to transfer a, a, a attachment to somebody. You could do that. But it was uh, those of us on Usenet at that time remember the famous cut and, and, and end, the cut here, end here. And in between was encoded binary text. And so uh, the program I remember using on Unix was a UU encode to encode a binary file into text form so that the email system could pass it. And then you would go into your editor, copy it out, and then you, you would run UU decode to bring it back into binary form. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, it was very primitive. Uh, the NSFNet was a project to interconnect supercomputers across the U.S. in the 1986. That really laid the basis for our modern communications networks today, because without that project, we would not have the strands of dark fiber we would have needed at this point in order to support the number of users and the amount of traffic that we have going across that network. Uh, so by late 89, internet service providers were starting to, to spring up and connecting households to the internet. AOL had their version of the internet, sort of, kind of, uh, we called it the cul-de-sac of the internet. Uh, instead of the uh, part of the <laughs> World Wide Web. But um, in the early days, there, there really wasn't much there. I was working on my master's degree in about mid-80s, and uh, um, <laughs> there, <laughs> we had internet, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't very powerful. It, uh, uh, you could do file transfers. You could send email. Uh, Usenet was... Uh, kind of, it was heavily used. It had uh, basically it was email it organized into topics, and so you could you could select which topics you were interested in, and then it would you know keep them for you, and then you could reply to other users and have a carry on a conversation about a particular topic that you both were interested in, or maybe it was a hundred people that were interested in it. But it was very primitive. It had to bundle up all of those topic areas and then forward them on to the next site each day with the changes. So uh, you, had to, <laughs> you had to find a server that had a Usenet feed in order to be able to read them. Uh, Archie was a tool that would allow us to search FTP sites. So for the first time when we had Archie, we could find files without having to ask somebody where they were. Uh, and so that helped a bunch. Um, Gopher came around about the same time. It was kind of a precursor to the World Wide Web. It used curses, so it was kind of a formatted text. It had some primitive graphics in it that were basically blocks of text. Uh, but, um, I mean, I, I don't mean like, uh, you know, like uh, a cow say, but it was actual. Uh, you could do some very primitive uh, graphics with it. That survived up until about the year 2000, and then it fell away. And part of the reason for that was the... Gopher was formed into a corporation, and they wanted to license the use of it to all users that were tied to the Gopher network. And as all of us know in the open source community, that is, that is instant suicide. Uh, once you've had an open source platform, uh, <laughs> the easiest way to commit suicide is to try to start to charge people for, to, for the software and for the right to use it. Veronica was a search tool. There was Veronica 1, Veronica 2. Uh, which was a search tool to be able to search Gopher sites, but it's all dead today. 
Finger was another way to exchange personal data with other users. It was a way that you could get your information out there, your email or your phone number, or maybe your mailing address that you wanted people to send mail, uh, snail mail to you. Uh, or it might also include interests that you had. Um, uh, if, but anyway, um, those were technologies at the time. So there wasn't a whole lot there. Tim Berners-Lee invented HTML to publish uh, uh, as a publishing language in 1989, um, and that really spurred the growth of the internet. Uh, Mosaic web browser appeared in 1993. There were others before that. There was Cello, there was Lynx. Uh, the University of Illinois had a real early one, I think was called Hydrogen, uh, but it was really complicated to set up. I tried a couple of times to get it to work, and it just it, it was just complicated. Uh, Netscape went public in 1995, and their stock price exploded. By the end of the day, they were they were at $58 a share, and the founders of Netscape were instant millionaires. Uh, the internet, and of course, that everybody was starting to jump in, thinking this was the latest gold rush. Uh, and so, internet growth skyrocketed uh, from around 15 to 35 percent, and that's huge uh, in in the numbers for the U.S. households by the end of 1997. Uh, but the, at the end of that 1997 period, the internet was no longer considered a luxury. It was a necessity. People were, were using it to do their jobs. They were using it to publish information about their companies on the web. Um, and Qualcomm stock, um, which was a chip manufacturer for a lot of the communications gear, their stock prices skyrocketed by 26,000%, 2,600%, I should say. 2,600%, and there were 12 other companies where their stock prices had soared to over 1,000%. Well, you know, that's a bubble, right? That's, that can't last. You have to have good business plans to be able to back that up with revenue generation to support levels of stock prices that high. And of course, by the end of 1999, the bubble burst. And a lot of companies went under. A lot of people were unemployed. Uh, the AOL in 2000 merged with Time Warner, which was the largest merger on record up to that point. Today, as of this uh, video, there's over 4.4 billion users, and of course, most of those are cell phone users. We expect that to grow to 5.7 billion by the end of 2020. That, that's almost everyone on the planet. You got 2 billion more to go, uh, and everyone on the planet will have access to the internet. So. That's probably what the, ne what the next few years will bring. As for the decades to come, um, there's a lot of things that need to be done, a lot of things that can be improved, but that's not for this video. So I think with that, um, I think with that, I'll end it the, uh, the usual way. I hope you enjoyed this video today uh, in celebration of the internet, because without it, many of us Many of us knowledge workers wouldn't have had jobs. And, and so uh, I think looking back, it, it, uh, it took a while to progress up to the point where it really became uh, more than a luxury, more than just a information store. Uh, I, I just wish it, it had become more than it is right now. Uh, there's a lot, it, there's, it could have done a lot better uh, in, as a public good and a public tool than it is today. But Hey, that's just the way things usually work. Hope you enjoyed this video today. If you did, please like and subscribe and hope to see you again real soon. And as always, bye for now.